Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Um, we're here today to talk about multi-cluster without federation. Um, this is a little bit of a twist on uh, the, what people commonly think of multi-cluster with Kubernetes. And uh, I want to uh, talk through this um, from a generic sense, but I also uh, want to recognize that um, I, while I work uh, now at Red Hat, I used to work at CoreOS. Um, and so what I want to talk through is the thought process that we had when incorporating some multi-cluster features into Tectonic, which was our uh, enterprise Kubernetes distribution, um, and kind of explore the space. We'll talk about Federation, where it stands today, some of our solutions, uh, and then kind of the future of what it looks like. Um, the first thing that we learned when we were thinking about putting uh, Federation uh, or multi-cluster-like features into Tectonic um, was that everybody is running multiple clusters. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Um, You've got your uh, dev test prod uh, type setup that completely makes sense. Um, you've got folks that are running in every region of Amazon, for example. Um, this is uh, very common if you have uh, you know, a points of presence type model for your software um, and you want to be in every region, uh, pick your favorite cloud. Um, and then you don't want to pick your favorite cloud, you want to be on all the clouds or you want to be uh, on-prem data centers bursting to the cloud, a ton of use cases here. Um, and then of course, what that ends up looking like is this. Um, this is impossible to manage. Um, you have to track all these clusters. You have to keep them up to date. You have to get access control straight across all of them. It's very, very confusing. Um, so let's explore that. Um, and does anybody have a guess what the average number of clusters that one of our enterprise customers uh, has, or what you're running today? Uh, is it five? Is it 10? Is it 15? Um, some people, you know, as we saw in the keynotes earlier, run a ludicrous amount of them. Um, we saw a less than ludicrous five to 10 was the average that folks were running. Um, and so what this means is the hybrid story is real. Um, this is needed and this is why everybody is interested in federation while you're all here today. Um, and so let's jump into uh, what federation looks like today, just to level set before we uh, look at the future. And Federation is really, you've got these two clusters, it's a set of nodes and you've got some API servers and uh, you want to connect some workloads between them. So what do you do? Oh, let's just take the same API server and just call it the Federation API server and throw it on top. So instead of scheduling out your API server to nodes, we've got a new federated API that just schedules out to other API servers. Makes sense. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a win. We got it. We did it. Um, we've already got all these primitives built into the, um, the Kubernetes API and let's use them. Um, the problem is that there's a bunch of uh, problems with federation. Um, first of all, for security, uh, as we're researching this, you know, our customers are running uh, these enterprise grade workloads and you, you care about this. And so the way that the API server works is it has root on a cluster. So when you move that up a level onto uh, talking to multiple clusters, now uh, if you own the federation API, you've got root on all the clusters. This is perfect. You're not just Bitcoining on one cluster. You actually can do it across all 30 clusters, for example. Um, clearly, this is a problem. Uh, and then the way that the Federation API server um, is implemented, it's just the, the uh, control plane, basically. And so this creates a single point of failure in the most common scenarios. Um, and things like etcd aren't designed to run across a WAN, for example. Um, and so now you're going to basically pick this entire tech stack, the control plane that you're used to, um, and it's got to run somewhere. And uh, as you know, you're all running Kubernetes. This is not trivial. Um, you've got a clustered stable database. Um, you've got your HA uh, API server and your HA controller managers. And then you've got all the glue, the TLS and the secrets that uh, join it all together. Um, and so this is a lot to manage, um, hence why uh, people want a solution to this problem. And this is what it basically looks like. You have your two uh, clusters and pick six of them, it doesn't matter. Um, it turns out that you know, because you can't run etcd across the WAN very easily, you end up running that entire control plane on one of your clusters. You just pick one somewhere. Um, so you, now you've got a single point of failure. Now that's not like extremely critical unless all of your components when you're doing your uh, software delivery are now uh, running through this one cluster. Uh, clearly that's not great. Um, and you know, this could be okay if you had a better failover story, but now you've got to instantiate a new control plane on one of these other clusters, reconnect all your uh, clients to it, hook it up to your Jenkins pipelines, all this stuff. Um, starts to become very, very complicated. Uh, and so we didn't really think that federation in its current uh, form was the way to go. Um, and uh, what we decided to do was really uh, take a step back and break up the problem into its constituent pieces and see if we can tackle some of those or maybe even reduce some of the scope from just doing uh, magical federation. You just 
uh, shoot the same deployment at a new, new API and it's just going to magically federate to all the clusters. Um, I don't think that actually works in practice. So uh, we've, uh, in Tectonic, focused uh, primarily on these two use cases. You've got uh, an app owner. This is somebody that you know, runs software in their namespace, and they've got uh, you know, a team of people that also work with them. And then you've got your infrastructure admins. These are the folks that have to run all these clusters, these 10 to 15 clusters that we're talking about. So let's dig into what an app owner cares about. So you've got uh, CI, CD. You want to build containers and then ship them out because your business makes money when these containers are running. Um, and so you've got to do things like hook it up and get the secrets all configured. Um, then you've got to do some cluster discovery. If you've got five clusters, where are they running? You know, because the an infrastructure admin might be changing those locations on you. Um, and then uh, should something happen, you've got a failover between those clusters. Um, and you know, this has a bunch of application specific problems uh, and kind of uh, sequences that you need to do. So that's a problem that you have to own. Uh, and then there's a the credential management in general of just rotating uh, secrets, um, regenerating TLS, all that good stuff, making sure all this stuff does expire. Um, but you've got to be on top of it before it brings everything down. On the infrastructure admin side, uh, you've got to uh, track all of these clusters now. You've got uh, 10 to 15 clusters. Maybe you're running hundreds of clusters. Um, so you care about the security of those. You care about uh, what's going on. And so you're responsible for that because the application owners are depending on you to provide that base uh, functionality for them to deploy all their applications and security kind of goes from the bottom up. So uh, of course, and you're an infrastructure admin, you don't trust any of those application teams. Uh, so you want to work within the confines of what Kubernetes gives you for um, RBAC and all the primitives that uh, help you lock down the stuff. And then resource limits uh, is your last thing. As you know, uh, we found with our customers, um, they would deploy their first or second Kubernetes cluster in their environment. And it's really great and becomes really popular because from team to team, it kind of spreads. Um, oh my gosh, we've got this new infrastructure environment. It's great. Um, I don't have to worry about this. I don't worry about that. I can scale easily. Um, and so you get a request for another namespace for another team. This team needs more RAM. Um, and so you have to care about that stuff because you can bring down everybody if you, know, you have resource exhaustion. And Kubernetes has great primitives built in for this, which is the great news. Um, but you've got to keep those synced up across uh, all of your Amazon regions, for example. So the interesting thing here is that um, these uh, two uh, groups of people actually have a lot in common. So infrastructure owners need to track their clusters. App owners need to track their clusters. Maybe there's something we can do there. Um, Credential management and security is, you know, should be shared by everybody. And so uh, how can we uh, tackle this problem so that it meets the needs of both of these groups? Um, and the answer is we've got a lot we can lean on in Kubernetes to do this. Um, you know, you're all familiar with all the, the things, uh, network policy, RBAC, all that stuff is built in. Um, but can we just make it a little bit smarter so it's easier to manage? And I want to talk through some of the pieces that we have to build with today. And if we were going to, you know, not just slap an API server and call it federation, but if we were actually going to build a piece of software, what are the components that we have to do that? Um, the first one is the cluster registry. Now, uh, this isn't that crazy. It's, um, it's a spec for an object. Um, so if you see uh, kubectl get clusters, you can list clusters. And those have attributes. This is uh, modeled as a CRD in our system. Um, and then there is a cluster registry uh, piece of software that we actually didn't uh, consume. We we're just caring about the uh, modeling of this object. How do I say, this is a cluster. It has these names, has these attributes, has these labels. Um, then it's located at this address. Um, so you can do this today in Kubernetes. Um, the problem is that it runs uh, as a single cluster. You have to submit all of your cluster definitions to every one of your clusters. Um, and remember, our number of clusters is dynamic. It's constantly changing. Uh, so what do we do there? We got to get this probably on all the clusters if you want software to be able to read and know things about other clusters in the environment. Um, we talked about uh, this before, access control. We've got all these folks, and they need different levels of access. Um, you've got your app owner who should be able to uh, administrate a namespace and be able to um, you know, add and remove people and uh, role bindings and that type of stuff. You've got an engineer who you know, probably has lower permissions. They're just shipping software. That's what they care about. Um, on the infrastructure owner side, you've got your SREs that need to have um, pretty wide access to stuff to be able to debug issues. And then you've got, in a, at least a proper setup, you've got all these robots that are doing stuff on your behalf. Um, these are your Jenkins workers. You've got all kinds of scripting environments. Um, doesn't matter what it is. And you want them to have as little access as possible to just deploy the single application that they're working on uh, and nothing else. 
And then you want to hook all of those folks up to staging and production or different environments, your different clusters, whatever it is. Um, and what does this? There's, is there a magic piece of software that does this? Um, I don't think it exists yet. Um, you know, uh, Federation can build on some of these things, but um, you don't have the, the smarts that you need yet. Um, and so you need to process this with something, and uh, we need to figure out what that piece of software is. Um, another really nice thing about Federation, which I think why it really took off and why you're all here today, is because it allows you to build your own workflows on the APIs that it provides. So you, know, you, you don't want to just run off one cluster. You want to run off several, and you want to have all these folks access to all those clusters. Um, so having that uh, customization is key. But the problem with Federation today is it's kind of slapped together, uh, to be honest, with some annotations. So these are a way that you can extend Kubernetes, and that's all good and great. Um, but here you can see that you can uh, set some stuff to rebalance either true or false. Um, awesome. Uh, and then you can say uh, min-max on uh, this cluster and that cluster. And so you've got some dynamic resource scaling type stuff going on there, and you're controlling your cost. Um, and that's really it. You know, you don't have a lot of really rich primitives uh, for what to do. If you want to have business logic in here about how you roll out to different environments, uh, that doesn't exist. Um, so you, you need to build that workflow on top anyways. So let's take a few examples and talk through um, how you would do this. So you've got your robots that are building your containers and uh, shipping them off. Um, but maybe you want to have a human in the loop. Uh, this is like kind of a, a chat ops approach or whatever you want to take um, that says, yes, this package of features is ready for staging. Um, rev that a few times and say, all right, all nine of those things now uh, can make it in. Let's build that. That's now production. Um, and a human says, oh, yes, I'm, I'm watching this. I'm going to make sure that it rolls out correctly. Um, and so that's one workflow that you could take. If you want to do the exact opposite, maybe you've got somebody um, that's building uh, a container locally for whatever reason, uh, or you know, there's a human in the loop on the build side of things. And then you want to have some software that actually you have business rules that say, I want to roll this out in a, a very specific way. And so uh, you want to encode that somewhere. Where do you do that um, to say, uh, roll out to an off-peak environment first, and then uh, go to an on-peak environment um, if it's successful? Uh, and you can encode all those rules into software, but that software needs to exist. Um, and this is uh, how we started uh, thinking through the problem is um, you've actually got uh, two different sets of users here that really need to do two different sets of things. Um, and you might need two different sets of software to do that. Um, you've got your application owners who are shipping out their new versions and changing secrets and changing um, their configuration values specific to their namespace. And then you've got your operations folks that have this baseline set of needs where they're uh, managing RBAC across all of your clusters. Um, they're changing quota as people's needs change. Uh, they're creating new namespaces as they're onboarding new teams or new teams are starting to run new applications. Um, and you need to keep all that stuff in sync. Um, but the use cases there are pretty widely different um, and probably need specialized pieces of software to do it. And this bottom piece is what we ended up uh, taking off uh, as the scope for Tectonic and its multi-cluster features. Um, and I don't want to get too much into the specifics of how it was implemented, only uh, to talk through some of the security concerns um, and some of the problems that we were solving uh, that you could probably solve as well. And uh, this was really broken down into two different pieces. Um, as I mentioned before, we're building on the cluster registry. That's the, the object that says this is an API server, and this is its location, and this is its name. It has these attributes. Um, and we were really using that as a uh, doing label queries across those for policies. Um, and the policy is really uh, the, the bulk of this feature. And um, what that looks like is there's an example up here on the screen. And it's to do um, RBAC, really, an access control only across a number of clusters. And to implement that, there's a small agent running on every uh, cluster that's um, talking back to the central source that holds these policies. And you map um, a policy and a set of clusters together and say, uh, over here, we're saying on every Amazon environment, I want to have um, these cluster roles and these bindings on these namespaces for these groups. Um, so if you've got uh, LDAP running between all these clusters, for example, you add somebody to a group, they already have access to all these things. Um, you as an admin have one place where you can edit uh, this, you can audit it. Uh, security folks love this because uh, you know they're all in one place. Then you can put RBAC on these policies, once again, already built into Kubernetes. Um, so you get these really rich uh, workflows that you can build around access control. Um, 
And the, uh, the part of this that was really specific is we didn't want to touch workload APIs at all, um, deployments, replica sets, all that stuff. Um, that's on that top side of the cluster. That's on the, the app owners um, and their engineers to figure out what that workflow looks like. Um, and this is just really to be very realistic about how we could ship this in the product. Um, and the sync policy is great because um, all we're doing is taking these uh, cluster objects and syncing them across all the clusters. And then we're taking the policies and syncing those across the clusters too. Um, and so you uh, phone in with a cluster and say, hey, um, this is my name. Send me all the things I need to do. It's a running on a desired state uh, loop, just like the rest of Kubernetes. So it, it really makes sense to admins. Um, and we think that is a really sane way to operate. So uh, let's walk through some scenarios of what this looks like in day-to-day -day practice. Um, we've got our three environments here. Um, so we've got our cluster registry that's tracking all three of the clusters. Uh, and then we've got our common set of RBAC on the bottom. And uh, we're in Europe, so we want to have our staging uh, environment really close because we interact with it a lot. Um, but maybe we have uh, you know, an international audience for our application, so we've got production namespaces running across all the clusters. Uh, if you are deploying to this uh, environment or in this set of clusters and you want to say, okay, this thing is ready to go to production, uh, this is what that would look like, you would have uh, this piece of software that you are submitting manifest to, um, and it's going to then talk to the cluster registry. You can imagine doing this in like a, a Jenkins uh, pipeline and say, deploy this to every production environment, uh, whether that's three or five or ten right now, um, and it goes and does that. And then on the ops side, if uh, you've got to um, change the resource quota of this staging environment, say you're adding a new feature, uh, we need more RAM for this. Um, OK, let's uh, change that, submit it to the cluster, um, and then the software will make it happen. Uh, what does it look like to add a new cluster, for example? Um, so as an admin, you go boot up your CloudFormation, run your installer, whatever it is. Um, and boom, you get your new namespace because your policy is now uh, on a label selector, not on a specific set of clusters. Um, that production namespace can uh, be instantiated immediately once that cluster is up. Next time your Jenkins job runs, because it's using this registry and not a static set of um, locations, you can deploy to it and you know, imagine you have some software to wire up DNS and all that type of stuff. Now, what if we wanted to remove our selector for our staging environment, because we want to run it now across all of our environments uh, for whatever reason. Um, so you submit that change to the policy, and it gets synced out immediately. Now, under the hood, what this looked like, um, we need to really solve that security problem of uh, federation, where if you own it, then you have root on all the clusters. Um, and so what we decided on doing is having a read-only pull model. Um, where one of these clusters is deemed uh, the source for the policies at any given moment. Um, this is, you know, typically stays the same cluster, but all these clusters look the exact same. So they're all running this agent, and it reads from the registry and says, uh, you know, like this uh, cluster will check in with its service account and say, I am uh, this US East cluster. Tell me the things that I need to abide by. Here are the policies that matter to you. Um, and you would have this loop running, and it's like, oh, I need to have this namespace. I need to delete this namespace, whatever it is. And the nice thing about this is um, this European cluster is acting as kind of our uh, reference cluster, and that's got all the policies on it, um, but it only really needs to have service accounts uh, for each cluster, and these service accounts can only read two different objects. They're not reading any secrets, workloads, uh, config maps, any of that stuff. They can only read clusters and cluster policies. So already right there, you've reduced your blast radius. Um, so A, these credentials can be revoked on a cluster by cluster basis. And then they can't even read from any of the good stuff, which is all the ap applications you're actually running. They can't uh, you know, modify uh, any of your uh, RBAC stuff. Um, it's all, uh, you know, they can't create new service accounts, that type of thing. Um, and so the really nice thing about this is in a failover scenario, all these clusters look the exact same. Um, and so you have this agent, uh, you just uh, flip a config that says, I am now the source of this because of, we were already doing all this syncing. It's already got the current state of the world. Um, and then that European cluster could go down. USE starts reading from the registry. Um, so that your failover story is uh, not um, boot up a new three node etcd cluster and configure all these things. Um, they're already kind of running an, uh, sort of an active active type uh, model. Uh, so the question is, where do we go from here? Um, these uh, components, you know, some of the software needs to be written. We had ex started exploring some of this. Um, in uh, Tectonic, and so if you're gonna do this today, um, what do you need to do, and how do you start taking advantage of the cluster registry and all these other uh, primitives that we have to build on? 
Um, and so let's walk through them um, from least complex to most complex, but with the understanding that you are going to need some specialized software to do this, um, to encode that business logic. It's not just as simple as putting the Federation API on top of our clusters and calling it done. Um, I think we've kind of all uh, explored this and it just doesn't really work. So uh, let's start with some uh, very not complex examples. Um, the simple bash script, everybody loves this. Um, this, you know, it's a simple loop through your clusters. So you're, you know, you can read, you can say kubectl get clusters, and then for each of those things, throw it in a loop. Um, but you know, this is instantiated by a human. Um, and you know, maybe that's okay for your organization if you uh, don't deploy very often or you're just prototyping something. Um, you know, run the bash script on your uh, local machine if you've got credentials to all these clusters. Um, it's great. But uh, what happens when something goes wrong? What happens if you run out of quota, for example, and you can't uh, make all your pods? Well, there's no error handling here. And yeah, you can make your, uh, your script more complex and add all these if statements and you know, really get crazy with it. And you know, maybe that's fine too. Um, but it's not like that declarative state that you're used to in Kubernetes. So now you're kind of uh, tweaking the way that you think about this um, when, you know, why can't we think of all of these things the same? And then uh, maybe you want to get a little bit uh, more automated with it. So you've got your Jenkins job. Um, and so for every um, PR to some repo that holds all of your manifests, for example, um, you do the same thing. You loop through all the clusters. Um, but now the human's out of the loop. You're, you're automating some of this, and that's great. Um, but you have some of the same problems. Uh, if something goes wrong, Jenkins can't magically fix that. Um, it just bails out, and so your software doesn't get deployed, and a human has to go back in and see what happened. Um, and then if, you know, uh, you might not have access to uh, look at the resource quotas or change the resource quotas, and so you've got to um, go back and forth with your teams, and meanwhile, your, your pipeline is stuck here. Um, so, you know, maybe that's not great. Another thing is if you have to model some business logic inside that says, you know, talking about our off-peak hours, um, now your job is running for a really long time. Even if your deployment takes a really long time, then your Jenkins worker dies and you're mid-deployment. You don't know what to do. You don't have that declarative state, so nothing knows what to do. Um, it's just in the state that it's in. Um, so that's just really not that great. Um, and we know Kubernetes is smart, but these solutions aren't. Um, you're dumbing down your deployment pipeline, but the cluster is really smart. Um, so let's get to a more complex example. This is not necessarily um, to do with like deploying uh, workloads. This is a very uh, specific example for ingress. Um, so Google has this really great demo of multi-cluster ingress. I believe there's a talk actually this afternoon on it if you're interested. Um, and the point that I want to make with this is that it's using some specialized software. On the right here, you can see that, oh, we've got a new CLI tool. This isn't kubectl anymore. Um, but it looks very much like it, um, and it's actually using Kubernetes tooling. Uh, so you can see there's a reference to a kube config there. Um, so it's starting to get into the Kubernetes ecosystem, feel a little bit more native. Um, but then it's also using some GCP features. Um, you know, it, it's really it's a tech demo. Um, I don't know what their plans for this are. Um, and the other thing is that now you're connecting this uh, kube native tool to some smarts that are outside of the cluster which is great if you're a GCP user, but if you're not, you know, um, this is not portable across environments, uh, and that's the whole point of this. You know, we want that hybrid story. Um, and just for fun, I actually was looking through the documentation for this, and look, we see one of these bash scripts. Um, this is the most simple version of that, is for every context in here, go do something. Um, so once again, you know, there's no uh, validation here, there's no error checking. Uh, if this bombs out, it bombs out, but just, Nice little illustration of um, how you can use this in practice, though. This is, this is how they deploy this, and it works totally fine in most cases. Um, now, this next topic is really near and dear to my heart. Um, this is a, uh, this operator pattern, something you heard Brandon talk about at the keynote. Um, we've been exploring this uh, through CoreOS uh, since 2016. And what this is, is bringing all of those smarts that we are just talking about, where it's outside of the cluster and the multi-cluster ingress, and bringing it into the cluster. Uh, so an operator is really a specialized control loop that's running uh, just like uh, the um, controller manager in Kubernetes running all of the uh, default primitives. Um, and it's listening on some CRDs to do some sort of logic. Um, and this can be anything that you want. That's the beauty of it, is you can bring all that business logic and give it a place to live. Um, and because it's using CRDs, it's A, a natural Kubernetes extension point. Uh, so you're using kube native tooling. And then you've got that desired state. This is, starts to feel uh, very nice. It's very similar to how you would write your deployments. Um, and 
uh, here's an example on the right hand side of just something I made up, but uh, this is a compliance database. This is a, a database, but it knows about uh, some legal issues that we have with data these days. Uh, so over here, I've got my spec. I can scale it up and down. We want to make sure that some of this stuff is replicated twice. Um, let's auto scale it based on how much uh, traffic is going in and out of the cluster. Um, back it up. Sure. Sounds great. Um, and then at the bottom here, we've got uh, this spec for geography. And let's just suppose in this hypothetical situation that you're storing some data that needs to stay in the EU, but maybe you would prefer it to be in Germany just because your other services uh, are mostly in Germany. But if there's not a German cluster um, using the cluster registry, then we'll deploy it somewhere else. So you can see here that the power of this operator is that this spec field is not very long, but you can imagine all of the smarts that are powered by this. Backup hourly equals true. That sounds magical, but you know, there's like uh, this operator could have logic for how to um, find where the object store is, for example, that it wants to talk to. Um, the secrets, you could even in here point at a specific secret. It could have one hard coded uh, or a location hard coded, that type of thing. Um, so you can really get to see this business logic um, that is embedded in the operator, and that's really, really powerful. Now, the nice thing about this, too, is because it's kube native, you're using your RBAC primitives. So imagine uh, the you know, common RBAC syncing that I just talked about in Tectonic. Now you're doing this uh, for all of these uh, customized operators that can be doing whatever you want. But in this case, uh, we typically find people um, starting out with install and upgrade of their software is a really nice way to model for an operator. Um, and this is a really nice way to get a Kubernetes native application. Um, the caveat, this requires a Kubernetes native application. Um, I think you're all here because you have those, so that shouldn't be much of an issue. But you've got to have stuff that can be containerized. And you know the operator, you can imagine it wiring up all kinds of things, start these deployments, create these secrets, uh, read off this config map, set up these services, um, wait for this health check to pass before this does this other thing. Um, all that complex stuff that you have that's usually embedded in either like a, a run book or maybe it's a bash script that you manually run or it's just in somebody's head. Um, you can model all that in software. And uh, the cool thing about this is it's not just a single cluster. You can now, because you have access to this cluster registry, you could have an operator that's doing all kinds of stuff. I mentioned earlier uh, wiring up DNS. I was just talking to somebody about an example of, you know, this could easily be talking to um, any sort of DNS provider to start wiring up things once the application is done. If you need to fail over and rebalance data before you uh, remove it or something like that, uh, you could do any, anything like that. Um, and you have it running in the cluster, so it's got all of the cluster state, which is really powerful. Um, I've gone on for that about a little bit. Uh, there's a, a bunch more examples. We just open sourced our operator framework. Um, and that's a both a build environment for building operators and then a runtime environment for how to run them. Um, so there's more information on that. Um, but we think this is a really exciting thing. Um, and we're excited to explore that further. Um, let's get to the, the thing that we're all here for. It's back to federation. Um, I told you we weren't going to talk about federation. But uh, there's a new uh, federation v2 uh, prototype that's out in the works. Um, and the special interest group. And I want to just briefly touch on this because I think um, all the problems that we found with Federation and Tectonic, um, the community has obviously identified these and is working to fix them. Um, and so I just want to talk to that for a second. And the most important thing is that the special interest group has um, kind of stated that one of their goals is that we don't want to tackle this entire problem space because it's really, really wide. As I talked about with, you know, you've got all these different needs for these different users. You've got um, different environments, different clusters. You've got to track all this stuff. And maybe somebody wants to model their uh, RBAC uh, policies differently than somebody else. And so you don't have to use all the parts of Federation v2. And this is kind of baked into the entire thing. And what it looks like um, is on the right. So you have, uh, it's modeled after a CRD. So once again, very uh, Kubernetes native. And um, you would model your custom object, so like our compliant database. Um, and then there's three kind of uh, sub-resources that this has. Um, so you've got a template for what this looks like. Um, and this is you know, uh, some sort of Kubernetes object. Um, and then this could be you know, something that's operated. Uh, and then you've got a placement modifier, which says, um, when you instantiate this template, where does it go? Um, and this is uh, label selectors and all that uh, kind of kube native stuff. Then you've got an override object that you can submit into very specific clusters. If you want to, for some reason, only scale up one cluster um, outside of what the scheduler is doing, say, uh, bump this limit, or I, want, I need five of these running just right now, just make it happen. Um, but you can actually override any value in the template, which is really powerful. So if you need to change a, uh, the labels that uh, one of the objects has in just a specific cluster, this is what you use those overrides to do. But it could be anything. 
Um, so this is where you could start doing the locality-based stuff where I need to override Germany and put a different country, for example. Um, this is the model that Federation uh, V2 is going to work on. Nice thing again, it's Kubernetes native, so you can use all the RBAC primitives that you already have today. Um, and then you have the nice primitives to push it into like a policy engine if you want, need to do auditing, if you've got a security group um, that really wants to keep a close eye on things. Uh, there's a number of projects out there that are starting to um, bootstrap into this space too. Um, so because we have these really nice objects to work with, uh, you can start implementing some of that. Um, the UX of this matters, and I think I, I've mentioned the word Kubernetes uh, native or Kubernetes tooling a lot. Um, this is really important because this is the way that folks expect to interact with clusters um, because it's what they do in their day-to-day -day job. You're, you're changing around uh, deployment values and config maps and generating secrets, um, and you've got that whole workflow. It's very understood, and that means that you're then portable. You do have that hybrid story if you're only working against Kubernetes APIs. Um, under the hood, this is implemented as an aggregated API server. Um, so it's using these uh, uh, very standard extension points for Kubernetes. And so once again, you're staying Kubernetes native. You're going to work across all the distros um, that are out there. And uh, this is owned by the um, special interest group uh, for multi-cluster. And uh, so um, they're driving this prototype. And if you'd like to get involved and uh, show up to their uh, meetings and review their code, add your own code, um, we'd definitely love to see that. Um, and then uh, some things that are also possible uh, as the, the next steps for this, um, you could start implementing a custom scheduler for this just because it's plugging into Kubernetes. Um, and uh, it's also uh, secured with service accounts, much the same way that our tectonic multi-cluster is. Um, so once again, Kubernetes using that RBAC, we're building on these pieces so we don't have to you know, have this huge problem space. We're condensing it down into something that's a little bit more manageable. Uh, so the takeaway that I want you to have today um, is that this problem space is going to require custom software. And uh, we just walked through a number of ways that you know a Bash script is custom software. Um, it's pretty attainable. You can go home and do this today. Um, and so I want you all to start thinking about that as you're planning for what you're going to do post-Federation, because right now, uh, Federation is not a thing. Uh, the project you know, is going to get retooled, um, but that's going to be a little bit. And if you've got five or 10 clusters that you want to you know, work with today, you need to start writing some specialized software, or at least start thinking about how your business rules get uh, modeled in some sort of logic. And choose things that are kube native. Um, the best user experience uh, is when you're using kube tooling. Um, everybody's uh, already used to all those primitives. Um, and then you get the power of Kubernetes is when you're building off of all these primitives. Um, that desired state loop is just killer. This is why Kubernetes is so popular. It just makes sense. It works. You can write software to do things that software is good at and let humans do things that humans are good at. Um, so take, uh, use the power of those, uh, explore the registry um, and all that. Uh, and then go home and make some software. You can do all, do all of this today, start. It's not uh, bad to have a bash script first and then you know, move to a Jenkins job. Maybe you want to explore using an operator. Maybe you want to explore some of the other tooling out there that's more specialized. Um, but you can do this today, and it's definitely attainable. Um, and then lastly, get involved with Federation V2. You're all here because you're interested in this problem space. Um, and like uh, the kind of charter for this group says is, um, we're not going to solve all of these problems, so uh, y'all can invent different pieces that can solve this. And uh, you know, every mo organization is different. Everybody models things differently. But we need those viewpoints to make this the best that it can be, to have the right extension points so that you can use the primitives but then build on top of it. And that's all I have. Thank you all.